And a very warm welcome to all of you who've joined this launch event for our uh, inspection, looking at how probation service is recovered from the initial exceptional delivery arrangements, which were put in place during the first lockdown between May and June uh, of last year. Can I have the next slide there, Ashley? <clears throat> So I think what I'd like to do is, is to start by really paying tribute to probation colleagues for the way that they responded to the uh, initial lockdown and the COVID pandemic and the huge amount of work that they put in over the past year to restoring services back to something closer to normal. And I'm, I'm sure Keith and the inspection team would want to recognise that. And we, and we do certainly pay tribute to the service in the report for the huge efforts that have gone in. I think I'd also want to give my condolences to the, the colleagues and the families of uh, members of probation staff who've died from this horrible disease over the past year and, and to the families of service users who, who also have, have died over the past year. And at the time that we drafted our report, over 30 service users and staff had, um, had passed away as a result of COVID. Um, can I also give my thanks to Keith McInnes, who was the lead inspector uh, on this thematic report, and you'll be hearing from him uh, in a minute, uh, and also to all of his team. It was a great team effort, and we collected a huge range of information in the course of this uh, inspection. This is the second of three thematic reports that we've been doing over the past year, looking both at the impacts of COVID on the probation service, but also about how the service is preparing for the significant changes that will be coming up later in this year through the move to merge um, CRCs and the MPS into, into a new unified service from the end of June. And we'll be publishing a report on preparations for that transition uh, later in the spring. Uh, COVID has had a, a big impact on us as inspector as well as you might expect. We had to suspend all of our local probation inspections at the end of March last year, and we've only just restarted those uh, this month, looking at some services in the southwest. And we continue to do all of our inspections remotely over MS Teams or, or other platforms. We haven't been able to go on site into probation offices for, for nearly uh, a year now. Next slide, please. So we, we looked, we conducted a first inspection into the, the initial impact of COVID on probation services during that first lockdown period from March to June and published our report uh, on those impacts and the response of the service uh, in November of last year. And that report is available on our website. As you'll all know, there was a huge impact uh, on all public services, including probation at the end of March. Um, um, a majority of probation officers had to close the courts. The volumes of cases coming through the courts reduced to about only about 25% of their normal levels. And there was an overnight change in the way that the service operated with a, a great reduction number of, of people being seen face to face, perhaps only five to 6% of, of appointments was being seen face to face uh, with the great majority of service users being contacted and supervised by phone, 80 to 90% getting phone supervision uh, and a real focus during that initial period and, and still actually on managing risk of harm and people's basic welfare needs. During that initial lockdown period, uh, the, as you'd expect really, the, the model was very much a top-down uh, model directed from the centre with a goal command system running alongside that uh, and some quite rigid rules really around how uh, much contact it was expected service users of different types uh, would get. Understandably, a focus on the highest risk service users um, with those getting doorstep door step village uh, visits or some of them continuing to get face to face uh, appointments. Uh, because of social distancing restrictions, all group based unpaid work had to be suspended uh, in March and very little unpaid work was delivered between March uh, and June. And obviously, group-based uh, accredited programmes also had to start, although efforts were made to keep in touch with the people who'd already started um, um, programmes. Uh, home visits clearly became impossible between uh, March and June and have still not really started again. So some big impacts on the service, a very centralised response in those early days. Next slide. <clears throat> 
our first inspection of that initial response found actually a, a, an encouraging picture in terms of how rapidly the service responded and the commitment they made to trying to keep some sort of services going. As I said, a real focus on risk and well-being, and we found in general uh, assessments and risk planning was reasonably well conducted during that first um, uh, uh, period. Uh, partnership working actually improved during that first lockdown period. Um, MAPA and MARIC meetings continued virtually and actually attendance was quite often better. And we found that agencies were uh, sharing uh, information and intelligence between themselves to assist with uh, delivery. And we found some initial evidence of, of innovation as well. So some early attempts to try and deliver RA programmes and other interventions uh, online. And in general, staff uh, welcomed the support that they were getting uh, and, and the majority, I think, um, welcomed the ability to work from home and felt much safer being able to, to do that. Next slide. So that was the period from March to June, that initial lockdown period. Uh, and as I say, we published our report on that in November. But we wanted to see how well the service was recovering from that lockdown uh, in that period from July onwards. At the beginning of June, people may remember, it seems a long time back, but um, things started to open up again. School started to go back. Shops started to reopen. The rules on meeting up started to be relaxed in June of last year. And HMPPS published what they called a, a recovery route map at the beginning of June and set out an aspiration to restart and ramp up delivery of programmes and start to reopen offices from the beginning of July. And we wanted to see how well that process uh, went. So we, vis we visited six local delivery units um, around the country, Bristol and South Gloucestershire, Buckinghamshire and Oxford, Derbyshire, Essex, Thameside and Stockport uh, and West Mercia were our fieldwork sites. And we talked to both CRC staff and managers uh, and the MPS. And we did that field work uh, from the end of September through to November. But we looked at cases that had started uh, from uh, the end of July through to September to get some sense of how casework was recovering during that period. And we wanted to compare the quality of work being done with those cases which started during that recovery period with the quality of work that was being done with cases that had started before the pandemic happened. So we took a very big sample, 240 cases, half of which started before the pandemic in January and uh, February, half of which in that July to September period. And we looked in detail at the quality of work that was being done with them. And Keith will, will tell you about what we found from that. We also wanted to hear from frontline responsible officers and we gave uh, staff in, in all six areas a chance to respond to a survey and a really good response to that, nearly 290 responses. Alongside that, we were very keen to talk to service users uh, and we employed an independent consultancy called EPIC to go and interview service users in those six areas and, were, and they were able to talk to 70 service users. Uh, and separately to the, our main report, we'll be publishing um, a, a summary report on the views of service users as well on our website, so look out for that. And then our final key source of data was um, the national data which MPS were collecting on the degree to which services were recovering right across England um, and Wales. And today we're also publishing uh, data from a Freedom of Information request, which gives you a picture of how that data looks up until the end of, of November. Finally, I mean, at the time that we um, started this work, uh, we weren't uh, aware that there was going to be a, a second wave. I think the general uh, hope was that the progress would be a, a linear one. As we all know, uh, we've now had a second wave of COVID and another national lockdown uh, in January. Um, and that has um, obviously hampered the ability of the service to get things back to, to normal and people may uh, well want to reflect on, on how it's felt since the end of November. So this is very much a snapshot of that positive recovery period from July to November uh, and the good progress that was being made during that um, period. Right, I'm going to hand over to Keith McInnes, who led the inspection, to talk you through some of the detailed findings. And then, as Diane said, happy to take questions as well after that. Keith, over to you.
That's great. Thanks ever so much, Justin. Um, so, so this thematic really uh, was, as, as Justin said, a logical next step to look at how probation services be, began the process of recovery. And it was a follow on from the work that we undertook during the initial lockdown period and looked at how services were managing in that initial EDM uh, period. So I guess in some ways the starting point was the publication in June of the of HMPPS's Roadmap to Recovery, uh, which was setting out plans to reintroduce those services that had been largely suspended um, in the early stages, so unpaid work and, and accredited programmes, as well as to uh, look at how to ramp up the services that had been restricted, getting staff, staff back into offices and starting to increase face-to-face -face contact with service users. It is, I guess, worth also pointing out that although that we, we, we talk about recovery really starting in July, which was the sort of the nominal starting point, in reality, I guess, recovery started as soon as services started to be suspended at the end of March and plans were in, in place to try and get services back up and running as, as quickly as possible and nobody knew at that time what that time scale was going to be and nobody could possibly have anticipated that uh, almost a year on we are still um, with restricted services. Um, so as Justin said, our field work took place between the end of September and the uh, the end of November when we went into into the six areas across the country. So if we move on to the the next slide, the emphasis really um, on recovery was a shift away from that command and control approach that had uh, initially been put in place to ensure consistency of of service delivery across the different areas and indeed across the country. The shift away from that really focused on ensuring that there was sufficient, um, if you like, regional reflection in enabling uh, regional directors, CEOs of CRCs and senior managers to be able to reflect and progress services at a pace that reflected what was happening in their areas. So just as an example, with national tiering, in the East Midlands, we had Leicester who, or which, and uh, has remained in tier three pretty consistently throughout the, the period um, since the, the pandemic first struck in, in, uh, in, in the early part of last year. While in the same area, Derbyshire um, for large parts were in tier two. So, that, so services needs to be able to be flexible enough to be able to reflect these, uh, these differences uh, within areas. From strategic point of view, the Probation Business Recovery Programme Board, led by the Director General, um, has, has, has been a focal point in terms of the, the, the national strategic approach. And that's been supported also by um, a series of, or a number of work streams that have been put into place, 14 altogether, covering areas such as accredited programs, approved premises, through the gate work and, and, and courts, etc. And each of those have developed their own um, their own models of, of recovery in order to be able to take this work forward. So overall, this work seems to be working reasonably well. And in our survey of responsible officers, 75% told us that they felt that senior leaders had communicated strategies well as restrictions had begun to be lifted, and 80% that they said that they'd received sufficient guidance on how to manage their workloads, which really is sort of very encouraging. Now, some areas have clearly had to struggle with technology. Technology has been at the centre of, 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 of an ability to be able to undertake uh, the work um, during this pandemic, and that has inevitably varied a little bit across the areas. Some areas really struggled in, in terms of even being able to get mobile phones for all their staff, and um, and this has varied, as I said, across the various areas that we, we went to. Now, by the time we were doing our field work, most area has managed to, to resolve many of these issues. But as the National Probation Service has been able to move on to using, for instance, Microsoft Soft Teams, some other areas have nevertheless struggled with that. And even when we were doing our field work, some areas were still using uh, teleconferencing as a way of being able to, to engage, which did make it fairly difficult in some cases. 
this was a particular issue, I guess, for CRCs. And some of the staff were, were talking to us about, in some cases, feeling in the CRCs that they were the poor relations a little bit in comparison with the, the National Probation Service. It is worth saying, though, that despite this, we saw little overt impact on the effectiveness of the services that were being provided. And we didn't really see a great deal of difference uh, between the areas that we, we looked at. One area that I would mention, though, is uh, an area of, of, of concern was to do with the extent of service user digital exclusion. Many probation areas, of course, have made huge efforts to make mobile phones available for service users, and indeed, in some cases, tablets. But we have been concerned about the extent to which it might still be the case that some service users have, have continued to experience some digital exclusion. And we would certainly ask that further work is done to, to look at this in a little bit more detail. One of the major challenges, I guess, for probation services under recovery has been that of getting um, offices back up and running either extending the hours open for those that had remained open during the initial lockdown, as well as moth those that had been mothballed effectively or had, had been closed during, during that period. Obviously, we were looking at, at, at offices and, 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 and looking at the way in which that was being undertaken. All offices in the areas that we were looking at we're able to focus on national guidance and that that came also from Public Health England. Um, and there was a really positive and good emphasis on staff welfare and safety. Whether that meant uh, protecting those staff who needed to shield and all staff were screened as well on a regular basis to ensure that it was safe for them to return to the office and actually what we found in our survey was that 73% of responsible officers said that they did actually feel safe going back into offices. Now, most offices have worked in bubbles, not dissimilar to what we find in schools, whereby <clears throat> staff, small groups of staff from teams will go in for certain parts of the week um, as a means of being able to see service users on a face-to-face -face, uh, basis gradually and also working part-time from home as well, usually using uh, telephones as, as a means of communicating with, um, with, respond, uh, with, with, with um, uh, service users. Now, Justin's already mentioned that some of the advantages that uh, many staff have experienced in, in, um, in remote working, offering greater flexibility and often a much better work-life balance as well. Um, and in many cases, that is indeed the case. Um, some staff, nevertheless, continue to talk to us about the pressure that they felt. They talked about what they referred to as COVID fatigue. And I guess in many ways that COVID fatigue isn't just the, as it is for many of us, not being able to see our friends or indeed go out to the pub. It's actually about some of the pressure of trying to get that balance and in the blended approach of working with, uh, with uh, service users, working part of the time in the office and working part of the time remotely um, using telephones. And I think for us, that whole blended approach, while in many ways very positive, there still remains many questions about where, when and how that blended approach can, can be uh, most effective. And if we move on to the next slide, um, th that blended approach, I think, um, and, the, and the balance worked for many people. And um, we've got a quote here um, from, from one individual that, that starts to give it a, a bit of a flavour about some of the pressures. So one individual was saying, for instance, that homeworking over a prolonged period has been very difficult, leading to feelings of isolation and low mood. This is not a job that can be done without direct contact with colleagues in terms of emotional and professional support. And as another individual also told us, as a working mother managing the demands of three children and reduced schooling, having them at different times, um, having different pickup times, as well as fitting this in with expectations to be back in the office is really difficult. And this starts to give a, a sense of some of the pressure and some of the difficulties that some staff are starting to feel um, as we were uh, looking at the whole recovery period. And if we could just move on to the next slide, please. 
So for some staff, this blended approach re re worked really well. So here's an example where one individual told us that managing the risk of harm over the telephone during remote reporting has been tricky, as I feel I can tell a lot from someone's presentation. I think I have a good balance now between a couple of days in the office and the rest of the time at home. But I guess in many ways, this contrasts with some of the other pressures that other people felt. We heard from two individuals who were very experienced probation officers uh, and one talked to us quite passionately about some of the pressures that he felt and some of the difficulties he felt where, and, and, the, and the quote says it really, too often I spend too long thinking about whether I should give someone a warning. It takes two minutes in an office, but when I'm at home, I ruminate and overthink about things. And for another responsible officer, um, due to being in the office one day a week, office days are usually manic and it can be quite stressful. Many of the staff talk to us about the difficulties they experience of trying to fit in the, uh, the contacts that they had with service users in a short space of time. And obviously, in, in many cases, service users live quite chaotic lives and getting them to adhere to quite tight timescales in terms of their, their access to offices can add pressure, uh, which can make it quite difficult. So we can move on to the next slide, please. So we wanted to, um, as Justin said, uh, get a sense of, 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 of the service user voice. And overwhelmingly in our survey that uh, Epic undertook on our behalf, service users spoke positively about telephone contact. And it wasn't just in many cases that they found it easier and more convenient. We had a number of examples where phone calls and, and telephone supervision was every bit as effective, certainly from their point of view, as it was if they saw individual probation officers on a face-to-face -face basis. And there are a couple of examples here, which I think give a, a real flavor of this. So in one case, um, an individual told us the phone calls would be much better and they're always focused. So one week is around drug use, one week is around positive things to do. Lockdown has been hard, but probation staff have helped as they have taught me steal, tools to deal with life when it gets hard. But before, when it was just appointments, it would just be like, I don't want to talk. It does make things make it make a huge difference. And another individual who'd been undertaking some individual work with his responsible officer said that regarding the drink driving program, this was done via workbook with chapters to complete and send back to probation. The workbook was enlightening. I learned things about the physical and social impact of of alcohol. So if you move on to the next slide, start to get a sense of how over the period of recovery, the shift occurred between the, the types of contact that individuals were, were experiencing. So to the left of this picture, we can see this is specifically to do with CRCs. As the pandemic um, continued and, and lockdown in the early stages started, the level of telephone contact in the purple bars increase con uh, con considerably to, to, to the point whereby, as Justin said, it was around about 95% of contacts in many cases with the individuals who have been seen on a face-to-face -face basis, those who were the critical few, were being seen, um, were, were, took up a relatively small proportion of overall contacts. And as we move through July and August and through into September, October and November, up to the end of the period that we were undertaking our field work, we can see how the amount of face-to-face -face contact increased as telephone contact started to decrease. So by the end of November, around 17% of all CRC contacts were face-to-face. Uh, were, were, um, were, were, were and if we move on to the next slide, we can see a similar pattern with the MPS, obviously slightly different given the different caseload that the MPS tend to work with, with generally higher risk individuals. But again, the pattern um, can be seen um, with an increase in telephone contact, and as Justin talked about earlier, an increase in um, doorstep visits um, through the initial stages of the pandemic and the early stages of, the, of, of EDMs and a reduction in face-to-face -face contact, which gradually increased with a reduction in telephone contacts and, and a reduction in, in, um, in doorstepping up to the point again at the end of November 
where overall around 33% of all contacts were on a face-to-face -face basis. So if we then move on uh, to the next slide and we start to look at the casework that we undertook. Excuse me. Um, I won't talk in, in, in great deal about court activity. Justin's already mentioned it. Um, obviously, with the uh, with the pandemic when it first started at the end of March, there was a huge reduction in court activity. And while this started to pick up again during um, well from May onwards, really the introduction of Nightingale courts and. Probation services introduced um, staff overtime and buyback um, uh, arrangements for staff leave to increase the capacity and be able to support the increase in, in, in court activity. There still remains a considerable backlog, and I know Justin and, and um, colleagues from other um, uh, chief inspector colleagues from other inspectors have talked recently about some of the concerns that it, that, that uh, continue to be uh, to be around in terms of court backlogs. Um, from the point of view of this particular piece of work, though, our major concern really was on how long it was taken to undertake pre-sentence reports in many cases. And in some cases, delays in, in cases actually getting to court and the impact that that was having on individuals. Overall, though, the case work we undertook, and as Justin said, a comparison between the two case samples pre and uh, pre COVID and, and in recovery, we found a generally good approach taken by uh, responsible officers and engaging service users and looking wherever possible at alternative uh, approaches to delivery. And the quote I gave earlier from service users is a, is a, a couple of good examples of how that work could be undertaken. Um, if we move on to the, to the next uh, slide, please. Um, what we found overall was that in um, in 18 of the 16 key areas that we looked at in terms of our uh, our, our casework, we found that the the recovery case sample, i.e., those cases that, that started their sentence or were released from custody um, from July um, until the end of September. Um, were actually assessed to be more positive than the cases that, that predated. So the case sample that came from pre uh, the pre um, uh, lockdown period, and I've given a couple of examples here of of, of, of three of them. Um, so in the first example, service users have been mean, uh, meaningly meaningfully involved in their assessment. It's uh, in seventy three percent of the cases we found to be sufficient in the pre. Um, the pre-lockdown uh, case sample and 77% in the recovery case sample. In the second example, it was 80% in the in the pre-COVID um, sample and 84% in recovery. And in terms of reviewing, focusing on supporting the service users' compliance, it was 73% in the pre-COVID example and the and 81% in recovery. Now, there were two examples, only two examples of the 18 cases that, that were actually more negative in the recovery case sample. And in those two areas, it maybe isn't too surprising given the nature of those particular questions, but the differences were relatively minor. 66% um, for the first question in the pre-COVID uh, case sample and 63% in recovery. And in relation to how well diversity needs were addressed during the period since lockdown, it was 52% with the pre-COVID sample and 50% in the recovery case sample. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see how um, if we take those two groups, those that um, those from the 16 out of the 18 questions where the the um, the recovery sample were more positive, the differences on average were far greater than those in terms of the, um, the pre-COVID sample. And the differences were actually quite minimal in relation to the two areas that we, uh, we found the differences were better in the pre-COVID sample compared with the recovery sample. Now, one particular area we were, were particularly encouraged about in relation to this, if we move on to the next slide, was in relation to safety. And across the Aspire model of assessment 
planning, implementation and reviewing. The four key questions we asked in relation to, to safety consistently scored better in the recovery case sample than in the pre-COVID sample, which, is, um, which was, um, was particularly positive. Um, and just to give a, a particular example of that, in that second question about whether planning focuses sufficiently on keeping other people safe, the difference between the pre-COVID sample and the recovery sample specifically for CRCs was actually 21%. The real challenges, I guess, um, uh, continue, and it is difficult to be definitive about why some of the differences did occur in that recovery sample, but our sense was very strongly that where services are having limited contact with service users, there does tend to be a far greater focus on the key issues, and I guess the real challenge will be as to whether or not this can continue once the pandemic finally comes to end if indeed it ever actually does, it does wonder sometimes. If we could just move on to the next slide, please. If we can move on, yeah, that's lovely, thank you. So in terms of accredited programmes, Justin's already said that services were suspended largely at the early part of the lockdown. Um, and in many cases, individuals were supported on a one-to-one -one basis in order to be able to, um, to encourage their engagement, to make them programme ready when programmes were able to be restarted, and indeed to be able to build on some of the skills that they had learned from the early parts of programmes that they'd had to suspend. Um, during June, July and through August, there was a development of a prioritisation um, uh, of programmes which focused ostensibly on sex offender treatment programme and on work relating to domestic abuse and the uh, Building Better Relationships programme. And as we found, um, as, we, as, as, as time moved on, the introduction of accredited programmes started slowly but gradually built and combined with the prioritisation framework, there was also the introduction of the alternative, the alternative delivery framework um, that was endorsed through the National Accredited Pro, um, uh, uh, Accreditation Panel, which looked at alternative ways of being able to deliver accredited programmes in, in, in an effective way, not only about reducing the size of programmes, but also right the way through to even working with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis, wherever it was necessary. What we found as we were going round was a really positive approach by all staff in trying to get programmes up and running again. And as that gradual increase uh, continued through, in particular, September, the, the number of programmes that were, were being delivered were, were continually rising up to a point of around 62% at the end of, uh, of, of our fieldwork period at the end of November. And we can see this on the next slide, if, you, if we can move on to that, please, where the, we can see the steady increase from what effectively was um, almost a flatline um, uh, situation during the um, early part of, 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 of the year. So if you can move on, yeah, that's lovely. So as you can see, as you move from left to right, by the time you start to move into the end of August and early part of September, there's a gradual increase in the, the number of programmes being delivered. Obviously, the number of programmes being delivered is limited by both space and the number of staff available to be able to deliver them. And, um, and um, although in some areas we went to, there were actually more programmes being delivered than had been the case prior to the pandemic, given social distancing and, and, um, uh, and, and issues around limitations, the actual number of individuals who were able to go through programmes was somewhat limited. And as I said, by the time our field work finished, we were looking at a, a level around 60%. It's worth noting, though, that in terms of sex offender uh, programs. This actually rose at that point to around 72% of the pre-pandemic level and around 65% of the pre-pandemic level for the Building Better Relationships program. So we move on to the next slide, please. Justin's already mentioned that unpaid work was suspended at the early part of, uh, of the year, at the end of March. 
and didn't really commence until the end of June and early part of July with a gradual increase with small groups. The greatest great in, um, emphasis, of course, was on making sure that staff were safe and indeed making sure that it was safe for service users to recommence the work. And again, those small groups had to be socially distanced with national guidance being adhered to and PPE equipment being in place. Many areas started to focus on new initiatives and in one area that we visited in the Northwest, we found that it was, it was, it was uh, the case that somewhere in the region of 75% of all the cases uh, of, of the unpaid work being undertaken during that time uh, at the end of November were actually new initiatives. Uh, which was in uh, in many ways very positive and also reflected on on um, some of the issues that were localized in terms of working in food banks etc um, now as services have continued to increase that that the level of of, uh, of delivery at the end of November was around about 50 percent of the pre-covid delivery level and as a consequence of that, there has been a continuing increase in the number of individuals who have reached the anniversary of their order without being able to complete the, the, uh, the orders made. Um, and by the time we got to the end of November, this was around about, uh, around about a quarter, around 23%. And this is a national issue. And at the moment, HMTPS has, has convened a panel consisting of probation and judiciary representatives and working with HMCTS to look at ways of resolving this background, this backlog, and there are various strategies being considered, including some uh, returning some to uh, some orders back to court, as well as crediting in some cases um, unpaid work hours to individuals who have complied with orders but been unable to complete them during, owing to the disruption of the pandemic. So we can move on to the next slide, please. So this gives a clear indication of the way in which there was a steady increase in the amount of unpaid work as it continued through from, uh, from the end of March and gradually started to pick up steam as it moved through. Of course, there are national variations in, in, in areas, um, but as we get towards the end of November, we're looking at a level around about 50% of the pre-pandemic level. So we can move on to the next slide, please. I just wanted to touch on, on, on resettlement um, a little bit. Obviously, with the lockdown occurring at the end of March, most prisons have continued to restrict activity with prisoners. And although by the time we were doing our field work in, in at the end of September, most prisons were able to have some started. We were encouraged, though, to see that most resettlement teams had adapted ways of working to ensure uh, continuity and, and uh, continuation of support on release. And while um, a number of ideas were introduced, including self-assessments and using in-cell packs to help individuals to undertake work that they were doing um, prior to release, um, we actually found that where where there was uh, where individuals were actually being moved uh, well, at the point at which individuals were being released there was actually a really good focus on liaison with responsible officers as well as engagement with community support um, and in many cases we actually found that that was better than before the pandemic which we were surprised about in some respects although many of the staff we spoke to um, emphasise the importance of this and we're very keen to ensure that this continues once the pandemic starts to diminish a little bit. And I just want to say something a little bit about homelessness prevention. This work, the homelessness and prevention um, scheme was introduced at the, um, at the early part of the, the lockdown around uh, March and April. Has worked through various regional teams throughout, and has since then has since then been extended, and indeed has been extended until the end of of next month. And we saw a number of really positive examples where individuals were supported at the point of release back into the community to find some temporary accommodation before something more sustainable could be made available to them. Um, so again, really positive in in many respects. And if you could just move on to the last slide, please. 
just wanted to speak a little bit about uh, about partnership work. Justin's already mentioned that in our previous a thematic that looked at the early part of of, um, of the lockdown period, uh, there was huge emphasis on, on on partnership and partnering work and work with other agencies, and we found that every bit as much in this work that we undertook. Despite the limitations, um, this remained a really positive area, and, and many staff talked about it being a far greater focus um, during this period than it had been before. In fact, one senior manager said to us it was more focused, more purposeful, and, and, and more collaborative. Now, in many ways, I guess necessity is the mother of invention, and so um, focusing particularly on partnering work and partnership um, agencies has been a really positive way of being able to, to focus on some of the key issues. In particular, we found this in relation to managing safety and, and really positive relationships in many cases, not only with the police, but also with um, children's social care as well. And just finally, just to make the point that many services um, are working in partnership with probation, uh, probation, probation services um, also try to adapt the ways in which they work in order to be able to reflect the, the needs of individuals and also the, the uh, necessity of, of working remotely. And in particular, we found this with uh, women's services, where in many, in many cases, there was a far greater flexibility about the way in which um, services were working with women in order to be able to offer uh, an appropriate level of, of support, which again was was really positive. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. So thank you for your time. Um, just to say that um, we're, we've uh, got our contact details up there, and uh, and as Justin has already said, the report is now available on our on our website, and uh, and of course I would encourage everyone to read it from cover to cover. Thank you. Diane, you're on mute. Oh, apologies, everyone. <laughs> Classic lockdown fail. Um, yeah, thank you to uh, Keith and Justin there. I was just saying a thought provoking summary of uh, the findings of the report. So if we move on to the um, question and answer session, and um, for anyone who uh, slightly missed the very beginning, we've got two options for the Q&A. There is uh, a little hand that you can see at the top of your screen. You can raise your hand. Um, once you've asked your question, if you click that button again, uh, your hand will drop. I'll come to you. Or there's the chat box function where you can post um, a question in the chat box. If you could say your name and where you're from um, when you ask your question or in the chat or indeed in the chat box, uh, that would be helpful just to know who you are. Um, so any questions? Bless you for the person in the background who just did a little sneeze. Um, any uh, any questions to start us off? And you're always being shy. Oh, and we've got someone there, I think. Maybe. Um, Laura Frampton, um, could you, uh, I've just seen your hand go up there. Do you want to start with your question, please? Hi, Diane. Yes, thanks. Hi, Keith. Thanks for, for the overview. Um, it's Laura, and I'm, I'm, I'm also an inspector, but um, not, not attached to this inspection. So really interested in, in your findings and, and everything that you, you've talked about today. I've just wondered whether you had any reflections on whether you've seen any practices over the last few months that you think the, the probation service or, or CRCs have found particularly kind of effective and innovative in terms of, you know, different ways of working that, that you get the sense that they may carry forward kind of post pandemic when when we eventually get there? I think it's a really interesting question, Laura. Um, a number of programmes have been adapted um, for alternative forms of delivery, and I made reference to that in, in my presentation. I think the probability is that uh, some of those will be continued with um, and, and worked with, um, not just because they can be delivered in a number of different ways, but also because um, there, it, it allows for individual delivery as well as, as, as group delivery. Um, I think there's still a bit of a question about how effective they are, and certainly one of our recommendations is that there is a, 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 a full assessment of, of effectiveness of those programmes to ensure that they are as, as, as effective. But I think 
I, mean, I use the term, you know, the mother of invention, and I think uh, I think a lot of people have shown huge creativity in in adapting ways of working um, as a means of being able to find better and more effective, in some cases, ways of of being able to do that. With perhaps also mentioning, Kate. So it's Helen Rinaldi here uh, from the Inspectorate, and um, just worth mentioning that we were pretty impressed with the project in a box yeah. that we came across. Um, which I think was developed by the Sodexo Southern CRCs, um, where essentially they were um, sending materials uh, home to service users on unpaid work for them to make masks um, and also greetings cards, which then they went on to sell using the money to, for charitable donations. Um, clearly there's some questions around how, how could we guarantee the service user was actually completing the work, uh, but I think that was all taken into account in terms of the assessment of who was suitable for that intervention. So again, you know, that's a, an example of some innovation. Thanks. Lovely, thank you both. Uh, thanks for your question, Laura. Um, I think we have a, a question in the chat box, but I'll come to Julia Walkley first, who's got a hand raised. Uh, Julia, far away. Hi, thank you. I was just wondering, as um, the recovery tend to be, to found, we found was a, a false dawn, if you like, and we're now back in a lockdown but we're hopefully now about to come out of recovery again what could do you think we could, as probation could learn from the first the false dawn if you like so that we don't make the same mistakes again and we can improve on the, our recovery coming out of lockdown now should i take that question um Look, I think uh, probation services did a brilliant job um, at, uh, at, at trying to get services up and running. Look, a, a lot of staff we spoke to felt under huge pressure. Um, and, uh, and, and what was really encouraging, I felt, was that the, initially there was quite a lot of pressure in terms of numbers of, uh, of, of focusing on increasing the amounts of face-to-face -face contact. Uh, and, 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 and making sure that that was increased as, as, as fast as possible. I think it very quickly became apparent that professional judgment was an integral part of, of, uh, of decision making as to not only the level of contact, but, 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 but the nature of it as well. And I think that lesson was learned quite quickly. And, and my sense quite strongly is that um, as, as, as long as fo the focus is upon the needs of, of delivering the service and working with the needs of service users, as well as obviously protecting the public. I think that um, I think what's already been learned has, has, has been really positive. I don't think we'll ever go back to, hopefully never go back to that position we found ourselves in at the end of March last year. Um, what I think is important is that the recovery is done at a steady pace and in a way that um, ensures the safety of everyone in, in, involved. And, and thus far, that has indeed been the case. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that that, um, you know, there's, there's not a huge amount of lessons to learn because it was it, it was a pretty good story, Julia, you know, despite the fact it did feel a little bit um, as we yeah, got through I... I yeah, wasn't trying sorry. to be negative or pick no, no, no. <laughs> sorry, I'm not accusing you of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, under uh, an awful lot of staff, under an awful lot of pressure, have done incredible jobs right across the country. Sweet. I know yeah. definitely in my region in the southwest, people have, you know, worked really, really hard and done exceptionally well. I just wanted to sort of, you know, we're coming out of lockdown, hopefully now, for the fingers crossed for a last time, you know, moving forward, you know, let's be positive about this and see what we can do to to really get get it right and do it equally as well. What I do think is really important is that the, the, that blended approach that is being adapted can be really positive, but we need to make sure that we do it at the right time, in the right place, under the right circumstances, and it isn't pursued simply because it's an easy way of doing it. I think I tried to reflect that a lot of staff feel under a lot of pressure and, 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 and making those judgments sometimes about the right thing to do, and the real anxiety that some staff have got about making the wrong decision. Um, and the example, I think, of, of, of the individual who was ruminating and really struggled to be able to make a decision, I think is really quite typical. So I think 
I know a lot of managers and a lot of, uh, of services are trying to support individual in those individuals in making those professional judgments. And I think that's the, the most important thing to learn from this. Yeah, yeah. And it's about the sustainability of working under those circumstances, I think, is, is the thing to keep an eye on as well going forward. OK, thank you. Thanks for your question, uh, Julia. Diane, you're breaking up slightly. Shall I shall I pick that question up out the chat for you? Yes, I, I would do. Yeah. So bear with. Laura Spencer. So Laura asks, in your research into accredited program delivery, you stated this actually was being found to be delivering higher than pre-pandemic. Was this broken down into one to one remote delivery and small groups face to face? And then she goes on to say, also, was there any research into group work delivery via remote methods? Um, I think the I think the point was that because groups were much smaller in some areas, what they were doing was actually running literally more groups, but with fewer people in them. So the actual number of people going through programs was actually lower than pre-pandemic. Um, but the, the, the point really is, and I think we already made, made it, is that um, the research is being undertaken as we speak as to the effectiveness of, of, of different uh, and alternative uh, approaches, whether that's even on a one-to-one -one basis. One of the things that I think is, um, is, is really quite interesting is that um, what we found was that um, consistently where individuals had been supported on a one-to-one -one basis during the recover the, the initial EDM period um, and being uh, and, and, and supported prior to programs restarting, there did seem to be a high level of engagement, both in terms of motivation and, and reduced dropout rates of, of groups as well. So while I think that's really positive, I think uh, there is more work that needs to be undertaken to get a real picture of this and, and how it can be, uh, what learning can be gained from that longer term. Justin, you're muted. Sorry, Keith. Just did, I think maybe the other point to make is while people are having to wait longer to start an accredited program, I think it's important to think about the one to one work that responsible officers can do in the meantime to prepare people while they're waiting. Um, observed an interesting uh, case this week on one of our inspections where the responsible officer noted that they've been supervising a domestic violence perpetrator released from prison last August who won't be starting BBR until next month and I think they were feeling slightly unsure about the, the work that they could do with them in the meantime and I think there are plans to roll out um, toolkits that responsible officers can use with um, service users as they wait and I think that, that that certainly should be a priority alongside establishing the best way of delivering the programs themselves and whether that can be done one-to-one. -one. I mean the, the accreditation panel did sign off the alternative delivery framework but you know, by the nature, these programmes were designed to be delivered face to face in groups of 10 to 12. And that's a very different dynamic to doing it one to one um, over a video conference. So yeah. some, some key questions to be answered, I think. Yeah, and that's why I was asking the question about the group um, research for remote, because I think the actual feedback from service users and facilitators is that they would like to look forward to kind of groups in that environment because like you said the biggest aspect of group work has been removed in that they're not with peers mm. and kind of co-facilitating as well yeah thank you and thanks thanks to nisha for for pointing out that the toolkits have been rolled out yeah um, so that's helpful yeah. i think the other thing we were the other thing to say is we were impressed with the fact that services were nimble and so you know they didn't tutors were, were brought into the mix and supported responsible officers in that in maintaining those contacts and um, from the word go which all of which helped in you know support compliance of individuals i think diane are you back are you back with us uh yes hopefully can you hear me okay yeah, I'll, I'll go. yeah. lovely slight glitch in my wi-fi i'm afraid um, does anyone have any additional questions 
Diane, I've noticed that Lucy Wainwright is on the call who led the work with service users. I wonder whether she might want to just um, say a few words and to say thank you to her as well for that work. <clears throat> Lovely. We've just had a very quick question um, oh. just in from, uh, uh, is it, uh, sorry, forgive me, Lucy Miklos? Uh, Luna, sorry, Luna Miklos. Far away, Luna, apologies. No worries. Um, my name is Luna. I work with the um, CRC probation in uh, Bristol. I was wondering with regards to um, programmes, because I did have a positive response services regarding one-to-one -one, they feel like it's more individualized um, um, for them um, I'm thinking in terms of the strains that it brings and it might have been discussed I did join 15 minutes later about um, sort of support for OMs to deliver because in my experience I'm, I'm also a trainee probation officer in PICWIP most of the time when I look at the programs to, do one-to-one, -one, do on a one-to-one -one basis. I I wing it, so to sort of say so. So is is there going to be support for for us to deliver the programs? Okay, do you want me to? Yeah, up? yeah. Um, I, I, I mean sorry, that's sorry. really interesting, uh, Luna. And I, I and I think uh, what I mean, we mentioned it in the report that there were a number of examples where. Um, facilitators of programs have been working with responsible officers to give them support in the delivery of, of, of work. Now, in some cases, that's been the toolkits, and in some cases, that's been adapted programs. But also, it's been about helping some responsible officers learn some of the techniques, if you will, of how to engage effectively with service users. And so, as, as a trainee, sort of helping you to build up the confidence and the skills to be able to do that. And uh, we, we've certainly seen some really good examples of that. But from a wider support network, we certainly saw a number of examples where, um, where groups of individuals from across quite large geographic areas were getting together to share experiences of ways of being able to deliver and ways of being able to work. And I think one of the really interesting things this whole pandemic has thrown up is it's made people start to rethink the way in which they deliver and actually start to be more creative and dynamic in some cases. And certainly we had some examples where responsible officers were saying, hadn't really had to think about this for a long time. And, 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 and this is, has, has made them do so, which has got to be a positive. I think the other thing to add, we're actually inspecting in your area at the moment, in your geographical area, Luna. So um, I, I, we're certainly aware that there is support available for responsible officers. So I would say ask, ask away, and I think you might find you'll get some. Thank you, Luna. Um, sorry, Justin, um, as, as you were. So I was going to say, Lucy, um, thank Hi, you Lucy. for the work you did leading the service user element to this thematic. Just wondered whether you had any last reflections on it. Um, do you know, I, I think it's been, I work in, as, um, in service user involvement and much of what we hear can be quite negative. And we were really pleased because this was not negative. This was um, absolutely um, in line with what Keith has been saying all the way through this, that there's some real positive change and some real hope for the future. I think service users generally felt that probation officers were on their side. And we heard from many, many people that actually suddenly this isn't about risk anymore. This isn't about me addressing my risk anymore. It's about me as a person and my well-being. And that was hugely valued. And I think um, in relation to that question about how do we get things right, I think maintaining that that sense that um the service users are individuals and their well-being needs can be at the core of of all the other risks you know it's um i think that's really valuable um but also so is keeping people's individuality 
at your heart as well because the phone calls were fantastic for so many people but other people said I miss seeing somebody I don't see anybody so I want to see somebody I'm desperate to see somebody um so I think that's that was one of the things that came out strongly for us is that everyone's so different and we can't assume that just because lots of people say they love the phone calls because they're convenient they're cheap they're um you don't have to walk past um problematic areas for you um not everybody felt like that and one of the key things for me and I'll stop now because I'm I'm aware of the time but one of the key things that stood out for me was about change in risk during a pandemic and we had people say that I might have been low risk at the beginning and therefore I, I then had to be on telephone calls but maybe I feel more at risk now and things change and being adaptive and aware of individual needs changing is, is important. Um, I could go on about this for hours and I, I won't but um, I'll no, leave it there. Thanks Lucy and I would encourage you as I say we're hoping to put your your separate report on service user views up onto the website as well so I would really encourage people to read that as well. Diane back to you. Yeah, lovely. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you for everyone's uh, contributing. Um, there is, um, if in in the chat box, there's a link to a very short survey. It's just five questions about today's event. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling in, that would be very grateful. It really helps us inform these communications activities as we go forward in the future. Um, and just to say that we'll hopefully be doing a few more events like this in in the next couple of months. So do keep an eye out on uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn and wherever you found us this time. Um, because there'll be uh, there'll be more events like this coming up. So again, thank you for your time, everyone. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone.